When you think of ancient Greece, what comes to mind? For most of us, it's marble and bronze statues, ornate urns, and classical architecture, togas, and wine. Or maybe it's philosophers like Plato and Aristotle, the invention of democracy, or vengeful gods and colorful mythology. But how many of us would say science fiction, artificial intelligence, cyborgs, and manufactured life? From the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University, this is Human Centered. Our current media is saturated with stories of futuristic robots, often responsible for saving or destroying humanity. Today, people speak as if it were a foregone conclusion that these artificial beings are right around the corner. But classicist Adrian Mayer says we're not the first to this conversation. Her recent book, Gods and Robots, Myths, Machines, and Ancient Dreams of Technology, explores the untold story of how ancient Greeks imagined robots and other forms of artificial life. Host John Markov sat down with Adrian Mayer to explore the similarities between ancient Greece, Silicon Valley, and how each envisioned manufactured life. Let me start with a question I had from, I have read the beginning and the end of your book, and I've gone through That's it. what I always expect people to, <laughs> so. <laughs> to be honest. But one of the first things I looked for was Gollum, and Gollum's only in a footnote. And so yeah. um, why, why did you stay away from Gollum because everybody else deals with Gollum? Or? Uh, no, I, um, Gollum is a medieval legend, and there is a fine book on medieval automatons by E.R. Truitt. Her book is called Medieval Robots, and I'm sure she must cover that. I'm covering antiquity. Most historians of science trace the beginnings of automatons and robots and making artificial life, those kind of things, uh, just even the concepts and then the actual constructions back to the Middle Ages. But for my book and my project, I wondered whether the concepts, actually the ideas, about making, creating artificial life, automatons, self-moving objects, uh, robots. What if those ideas could be imagined long before the technology even existed or was feasible? So I went all the way back to Homeric times, 2,700 years ago, and I found a lot of evidence for that. So I don't, I don't, I stop after the Hellenistic period. I take it up to about the first century. A.D. or B.C. And do you think then that the roots of the Golemic stuff lie, would you, did it get reinvented or is there a parallel or were there linkages? I don't ever look for the Ur myth or folklore that is dispersed around the world. I'm a big believer in parallel development, independent development. And I think the tendency to want to create artificial life is pretty universal and pretty timeless. I've found a lot of evidence here. That's what I've been doing this year, is looking for comparative folklore and mythology around the world of ideas of creating artificial life in antiquity. So I have evidence from China and India as well. You know, I, I, I only went, as when I was looking for, for antecedents, I only went as far as Gollum, but then I, I did stumble across some Hindu mythology that right. seemed to predate... Um, well, I found a, um, I, I published in the conversation this uh, legend about Buddha's relics, his bodily remains being protected by robotic warriors. <laughs> it's a legend that goes all the way back to the time of Buddha's death. So I've Congress written that defensive up. Defensive weapons. Yes, um, and that they were defeated by King Ashoka, the great king of the Mauryan Empire. Uh, so I don't, I don't think it's uh, unique to the ancient Greeks. It's just that we have a lot of material from ancient Greece and Rome. And I have one more thing to say about the Gollum. One thing I focus on in my book, just for a definition, is that I want to distinguish between inert matter or things that are suddenly brought to life by a god or a magical spell. And I think that the Gollum falls into that category. It's a series of letters or words or sacred words that bring the Gollum to life. And I'm looking for 
entities, robots, automatons, self-moving objects that are described as made through biotechne, which is a Greek word for life through craft, that there's some kind of idea of technology that goes into it. So I'm looking at all of the creations, fabrications by the god of innovation and technology, Hephaestus. And there are similar gods in Hindu mythology. Visvarkarman is the god of invention and engineering in Hindu mythology. And so there are some uh, entities that he creates, he fabricates them. So that's, what I, that's the difference also between the entities I'm looking at that are biotechnically made and those that are brought to life by magic. I mean, Pygmalion and, and Galatea, the ivory woman carved by Pygmalion as his ideal woman, she was brought to life by a goddess with a, you know, just by fiat, by command. She wasn't manufactured as an automaton. That raises the interesting question to me that there is a closer link, linkage between actual technology at that point in history and the mythology you saw. I, I, the only thing I know in detail is an, the Antikythera mechanism. Right. But when I explored Antikythera, I realized that there is evidence of other robotic technology or automated technology. I think there were doors that opened. Yes. And there were other things. that yes. Maybe there were even robots. Were, were there any? Uh, there are a lot of references to animated statues, statues that could move, make noises, blink their eyes, raise their arms, maybe even pour a libation, open a temple door. And I found a lot of evidence. You know, we think of the uncanny valley as something really modern. I think it was first identified by the Japanese um, roboticist Masahiro Mori uh, in 1970. But I found evidence for similar effects in classical antiquity when artists and sculptors began to have the technology to make unbelievably lifelike, life-size statues out of bronze and marble. And you have to remember that these were painted and they were painted very realistically, not in those garish colors that we see now when they reconstruct the colors of ancient marble statues. They mixed the pigments with wax so that they actually had a, had a, a sort of texture even and a warmer appearance. And think of these statues in temples, they're life-size, hyper-realistic, and you see them at night, nothing but an oil lamp or moonlight and people imagine that they're moving. But then there are actual statues. It's, it's easy with levers and uh, gears and pulleys, um, hydraulics and steam to make a statue who, whose eyes can blink. And remember, the eyeballs are, are made of um, ivory with inlaid gems so that they spark and look alive. So the, there are all these descriptions of this uncanny valley effect in Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. That's yeah. great. Uh, yeah. That's cool. So, but that makes me want to jump to Silicon Valley today because I had, I, you mentioned sort of the possibility or, or the, the reality that we're coming to this same kind of black box situation where in that period these technologies were sort of treated as black boxes. All of a sudden we're back with advanced technology treating them as black boxes. Yeah. But also then this other parallel that you're raising that is, um, there was the mythology, and there was the reality of their technology. Is there a parallel to Silicon Valley, perhaps, where, where our futurism, where you know the belief that we're going to have these thinking machines and stuff, is is there a connection or a p parallel? I couldn't find much evidence for the ancient Greeks in their mythology or even in their writings. Looking forward to advanced technology, what's very interesting is that the ancient Greeks tended to look back and think that there was advanced technology in previous civilizations. That's a big difference, I think. But the other thing is that the black box, I think we're coming kind of full circle, as you mentioned. We're getting back to this, we use these things, but we don't know how they work. What's interesting about my research is that when I found the story of Talos, the first robot in Western literature, a giant bronze man, who was first described by Hesiod, lived in the time of Homer. So we're talking about about 700 BC, describing this self-moving giant robot made of bronze. And he is a robot. He fits our definition. He's self-moving. He 
carries out activities, interacts with his environment. He's kind of a cyborg. He's um, partly human, partly machine. And we even know his inner workings and his power source. Those are two things you need for the definition of a robot. And this is the earliest account of a robot we have in Greek mythology, and that's amazing to me. So he's, he's kind of a black box because the inner workings are mysterious and vague. He's, he's built with a, he's hollow, and he has a single tube running from his head to his feet, and through that tube pulsates ichor. Ichor is the life fluid of the gods. It's a mysterious fluid that makes them immortal, and the whole system is sealed by a bronze bolt on his ankle. Now, he's made by technology. He, we know his inner workings. We know the power source. I mean, these are mythologically couched, and yet people are thinking about what would make this thing work. And then what takes him down is a sorceress, Medea, figures out that he may be immortal because he's got the power source is supposedly perpetual motion, but if we can remove that bolt, his I-Core will bleed out and will destroy him. So he's made by technology, taken down by technology. Interesting little lesson there well, <laughs> for today. <laughs> I was There's ask, always going to be a hacker. <laughs> what other cautionary tales does it pose for the modern world? Were there other things that emerged? Um, you know, the Terminator debate, for example. A killer robots. Yeah. Uh, uh, Talos was a killer robot. He was made to defend the island of Crete uh, for King Minos, defend the island of Crete against approaching strange ships, and he could spot them. And when he spotted a strange ship, he was able to pick up a boulder and throw the boulders at the ships to sink them. But then in close combat, should someone come ashore, he could heat his body to red hot, he's made of bronze, grab up a victim and hug them to his chest, roasting them alive. So Jason the Argonauts, they're doomed almost to be his next victim, but they've got Medea with them. She's kind of like a techno wizard. She figures out these things. What's interesting is that Talos has a very lively modern afterlife. The first uh, surface-to-air missiles that were mounted on ships after World War II, the scientists named them the Talos rockets. So, I mean, they knew the story, and their patrol, uh, these ships are patrolling the seas uh, with their Talos rockets. And, of course, the Pentagon and DARPA are working on a Talos uniform for a special ops soldiers. It's interesting that uh, the Talos was an autonomous weapon system. It, it seems like the Greeks had none of the sort of ethical qualms that we have today about whether a human's in the loop and whether a human makes the killing decision. They just gave the autonomy to the to the weapon and let the weapon make they, they right. crossed right and they did they line. did not realize they did not expect the neither the maker Hephaestus nor the de, uh, person who deployed Talos uh, King Minos expected Talos to develop a kind of human like consciousness in which he could be persuaded by Medea to allow her to remove the bolt on his ankle. He agrees to that because she says, I can make you immortal and invulnerable. He doesn't know his own nature, and he agrees to that. So that was an unexpected... Uh, um, was that a, fl- a weakness? Was that... The, yeah. That's his vulnerability, oh, yeah. and she is kind of a hacker. She exploits it. Um, yeah, so... But there are other stories you ask about whether we have any lessons from antiquity. Pandora is uh, one of the perfect examples because we know the fairy tale version probably of Pandora in which she's an innocent young girl who she just can't restrain herself from opening this forbidden, fateful box. It was originally an urn or a jar and a mistranslation made it into a box. But people are always bringing up Pandora's box when they talk about advanced technology and AI and robotics. But the story is much more relevant than people realize because the original story is that Pandora was a fembot made by Hephaestus with one mission on Earth, and that is to ingratiate herself into human society and then open that jar filled with all of the diseases and sufferings and misfortunes that would plague humankind forever. This was 
an automaton sent to Earth by Zeus to punish humans for accepting the technology of fire from Prometheus. Was that sort of original sin in some sense? Um, people have compared it to that, but uh, what's interesting is that Prometheus in, the, in Greek mythology supposedly created the first humans and then felt bad because they were so vulnerable. And so they weren't as uh, well prepared to defend themselves or live in the world as animals were, so he gave them, stole fire from the gods, gave fire, and that's a technology that allows humans to come together, cooperate, develop language, and other tools. Zeus is very, he's a, he's a tyrant, and he's vengeful. That's something I was pursuing here at the center this year, is whether technology favors tyranny. And it goes all the way back to Zeus. <laughs> <laughs> and have you? What about your conclusion about the modern question? <laughs> Does it favor? I, uh, you know, well, I think we looked. I internet. think we, and I, I not only looked at mythology. It's autocrats and kings who deploy killer robots like Talos and Pandora. So then I looked at ancient ancient Greek history, and it turns out that there are many tyrants who commissioned engineers and craftsmen to create machines of malice for torture and for war. So technology did favor tyrants in antiquity, in history and myth. Yeah. So I think we need to look very carefully at who's pushing most to make AI technology, human enhancements, things like that, robots. And they always give us a story that it'll be beneficial. For instance, I, I, most recently I read about this AI that's going to be, going to be able to read lips. And they say, oh, this will be a great boon. But we don't always immediately know what the uh, negative Unexpected consequences can be. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I, I saw you also explored, you know, in What the Dormouse Said, I discovered that there were two labs at the dawn of interactive computing on either side of campus. There was John McCarthy's lab, which, you know, he coined the term artificial intelligence, and he started to build this machine that would be artificially intelligent in 62. And in the same year... Engelbart started out to augment human on the other side of campus, and there was this tension or dichotomy, and you point to the same tension between the the artificial and the and the uh, what you call you called it um, the imitation and the augment, augmentation of that was already in play. Yeah, yeah. All of these myths about uh, automatons and uh, self-moving devices and the entities that are created by Hephaestus are always described as made not born, which emphasizes their manufactured or fabricated nature as opposed to their natural, biologically reproduced nature. Um, for instance, Pandora is made to be an artificial woman more beautiful than any living woman and endowed with such beauty that she, in, that she arouses painful lust in men. <laughs> so she's, she's one of the first uh, sex bots and... and Pygmalion has another one. So, I mean, even those things go all the way back. But I think that phrase, made not born, is really, really significant to us and to the Greeks because it, it is the distinction between natural and unnatural, real and artificial, manufactured and biological. So, And we're right back there, whether it's with AI or with CRISPR, I mean, there's, you know, the, the opening sentence in your whole earth catalog was, we are as gods and we might as well get good at it. <laughs> yes. And, which raises all kinds of questions about... I, I remember feeling very dubious about that when I opened it. Yeah. Uh, so this, this notion that bubbles up all the time, this implicit desire to create human life, to make human life or human-like life, did you find, did you come to any sense of... Why it's innate? Why it? What is it about humans that want to do this? They want to become gods. I don't know. <laughs> but I mean, these stories are not just uh, limited to Greece. There, there's an Egyptian god who supposedly made the first humans. As I said, Prometheus was credited with making the first humans. And there's the the Hindu stories, and there's Chinese stories about craftspeople or artisans or engineers who want to create artificial life. Uh, that, that was really interesting to find all of the, uh, these miniature gems, these exquisitely carved gems from the Etruscan craftspeople oh, yeah, yeah. depicting Prometheus 
making the first prototypical human, starting with the framework. He starts with the internal workings, the, the skeleton. And all these gems show him as an engineer, a craftsman, making the framework of humans. And then some of them even show him adding the flesh and the molding them into uh, basically automatons, which is a phil philosophical question. And I imagine you might have uh, been planning to ask me about that. And of course, philosophers have, since Plato, um, probably before, but Plato expressed it, let's imagine we are the automatons of a superior being. Uh, so those little gems showing Prometheus creating the first humans make you think that way too. So, um, yeah. I wanted to ask you about something related. Um, so the other thing I notice about modern culture is we have this tendency to anthropomorphize every animate and inanimate object we come in contact with. There seems to be some human quality that want to you know, turn to talk to our cars or to treat our cars as humans. Or, I may or, be one of the few people that doesn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I like to know the difference between well, human and non-human, but know, I certainly have noticed that. I have never given my car a name. So, <laughs> but, but we tend to do that, and I think psychologists, uh, there are a lot of psychologists who try to figure out why do we tend to anthropomorphize inanimate objects, especially the ones that seem alive, that we seem to interact with in some way. Um, and I ran into that in my first book about how Greeks and Romans interpreted gigantic, enormous fossils of extinct animals that they found throughout the Mediterranean. And of course they're not, because it's an earthquake zone, seismic activity, the bones are all jumbled and broken, except for the largest limb bones, so like a femur, shoulder blade. Uh, that's all that they find. And, of course, because they're prehistoric elephants, like mammoths and uh, mastodons, they're mammals, so the, those bones look exactly like our human, except they're three times the, the size of humans. And so they anthropomorphized them and said that they belonged to the heroes of the golden age of myth, who were three times the size of us puny humans. Yeah. <laughs> so people tend to anthropomorphize. I think it just makes it more exciting for us. I mean, we look for life in space, too. We, we don't... Yeah, we're always looking for allies or enemies that are like, like us in yeah. some way. But psychologists have, uh, when it comes to robotics or AI, if the entity has a name or you give it a name, and then it has a backstory of, of some sort, then you really tend to anthropomorphize it, recognize it as some humanoid entity. Now, just thinking of uh, the movie 2001, when Hal is being disabled by the astronaut, he starts to tell his backstory. We know his name, but now he starts telling us his memories from childhood and singing, and that just that is when he seems most human. It's got the backstory and the name. Yeah. And I think that was true for, for Talos, the bronze robot in antiquity. The artists humanized him on the vase paintings. They paint him as a bronze man. He's different, he's larger than the other humans around him, and his, his flesh is painted in the same way they paint bronze armor. So it's a yellowish cast to it, and he's got seams and rivets and yet when he's dying, he's falling back, his eyes are rolling up like a human, and one artist actually painted a teardrop falling from his eye. So I think that they, in antiquity, did anthropomorphize this automaton, and it just seems to be a timeless uh, yeah, and true. universal tendency. One of the things that um, I stumbled across when I was writing Machines of Loving Grace, when I was talking to a generation of AI researchers I kept running into guys who were roboticists and AI people who'd gone into the field after they saw 2001 and they wanted to build HAL. This was true. They actually made the decision to go into the field after they saw the science fiction movie. And was it sympathy for HAL or was it the interest in his human qualities before uh, before his demise? I confess I did. You know, that's the obvious question to ask that I didn't, <laughs> didn't ask. <laughs> but it is an obvious question because that's not the reaction I had when I saw no. <laughs> Stay away. Well, it's, it's really funny. People ask me, oh, you're so into AI and robotics. I, I went to uh, 
Andreessen Horowitz. I t- did a mm. podcast there, and then I went to Bloomberg Beta. Everyone asked me how, you know, so you must really, and I, I don't even speak to Alexa. I have nothing to do with Siri. I, I drive across the country. I drive up to Montana and back. I, I use like three different printed maps. I don't even, I don't use GPS systems. Nothing. I don't want anything to do with it. <laughs> The last of my kind. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So might there be a, a book of yours in, in the study of geomythology? Is that, are you f- that focused on it? That, that is one of my projects this year that I'm working on. I owe Princeton University Press another book, and it's going to be about geomythology. So I'm just trying to figure out the focus that I'm going to take. I'm very interested in geomythologies uh, worldwide, but also especially Greece and Roman because I know that best and there's a lot of material. Mythology and folklore about natural disasters I think would be quite interesting. Is Atlantis on your radar? (laughs) Yes, because uh, I mean the story comes from Plato and we don't know whether he made it up or whether there was this story or rumor or uh, legend floating around. We know that Plato made up a lot of folklore that he called folklore, but we also know that he took things from Herodotus and other writers, and another thing to keep in mind is how much of ancient literature we've lost. So there could have been even writings about Atlantis that we don't know about. But um, Was Santorini and, and, and the volcano a, a candidate for, is that still thought of as a candidate for... Um, it could have influenced the story or the idea of a, a, a very advanced civilization that was destroyed by a natural catastrophe. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, but we also have other stories of real Greek cities that were inundated by tsunamis because of earthquakes in the Aegean. Yeah. Uh, Heliki is one of them. And I'm interested in how people describe the natural disasters in antiquity and then how they thought maybe they could predict them or how they could uh, describe what caused them. So I'm, I'm really interested in that. Yeah. yeah. So I think my next book will be on ge- geomythology. And when you pursue these things, do you do it from here or do you get to go to Greece? Do you actually get to... <laughs> <laughs> I have traveled a lot in Greece and uh, I have very, very fond memories of living there for several years where I did a lot of research in the uh, libraries there and also in the topography and just traveling around a lot. So I would love to go back and actually, if I want to write a field guide to geomythology, I would have to go back, yes. Luckily, I have a research fund. (laughs) So have you spent much time in conversation with your you're a Bergruen fellow this yes. year, and you know one of your compatriots, Tobias Reese, has a project about sort of the redefinition of the human. Yeah. And have you gotten involved in that at all? I haven't been involved in redefinition of the human, but I was working with Niels Gilman on a, um, all of the Bergruen fellows were asked to write an article based on our research. So I have just finished the draft of my article on human enhancements, ancient and modern comparing just their ideas of human enhancements, not just prosthetic devices, but that figure is uh, a lot in it. So I'm waiting for the um, editorial suggestions on that article. Where will you try to publish it? The Bergruen Institute is planning to establish a new magazine, I believe. And so these articles are for that. I'm intrigued by the notion of cognitive prostheses. As, yeah. uh, as, yes. as we get older and Absolutely. in our current, <laughs> in current incarnation. Yes. Um, I, uh, the other Bruguin fellows that I've really had a lot of interaction with, I only got to meet Joshua Burson once. He's based in L.A., and so we, we met in L.A. All of the Bruguin fellows gathered there in September, and but we've been corresponding back and forth. We, we have a lot of interests in common. And also Joseph Lemiel, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. He's based at the MIT AI lab this year in Massachusetts. And we have talked a lot about Aristotle and artificial life. So that's been very interesting. In fact, there's a, a passage in Aristotle that I just can't get out of my mind because it's the one instance where a philosopher is talking about the myths, the Greek myths of artificial life. 
and then actually musing about the future. It's a tiny passage, but it's so remarkable. Aristotle is, it's in the politics, he's justifying the practice of slavery in ancient Athens. He has a really dubious argument, and but he takes time off from that. First of all, he's saying that slaves and servants are like tools or implements for us, and the best tool or implement would be one that can anticipate your needs. And if only we had slaves that could anticipate your needs. Well, Hephaestus, the god of innovation and technology, the blacksmith god, in Greek mythology, Hephaestus built automatic gates or doors for the heavens that would open and close as the chariots of the gods approached them. He built a, um, a bank of automated bellows for his forge that anticipated his every need. They could blow more or less air as he needed it, working with the with these heated metals. He created a set, a, a, a fleet of driverless carts that would deliver ambrosia and nectar to the gods' banquets and then return when they were empty. He, I think the most remar- remarkable of his creations was a crew or a staff of golden maidens. These are women made of gold who could anticipate his needs, helped him in his workshop. And uh, Homer, this is in Homer's Iliad, Homer says they were endowed with reason and speech, but even more remarkably, they were endowed with all of the knowledge of the gods. Now that's a data dump. (laughs) You don't need that much information, but you never know, you might. And that's that is an an ancient mythological version of AI. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. but what's interesting about Aristotle is that he muses on this. He said, "If only we could here on Earth have those automatons created by Hephaestus. What if we had looms that could weave on their own? What if we had musical instruments that could play themselves? We would have no need for slavery." And then he doesn't continue the argument, goes back. But, I mean, the fact that he wrote that down suggests to me that he may not have been the only one thinking that way. But you're saying, earlier on you said that was largely an exception. The Greeks tended to look backwards and not look forward. That is the one instance I know of, of looking forward. You know, Hegel um, has this discussion of the dehumanization of the master in the relationship to the slave, which was... Interesting. It's in the phenomenology of mind. I'm it harms, not sure. It harms the master as much as the slave. And I was talking about the design of AIs with Alan Kay, who's the person who's largely thought of to have invented the modern personal computer yes. that we use. And <laughs> Kay said, well, you know, it's a design choice. You can design these things as partners or as our masters or as our slaves. And that's a human choice to make that design decision. Yes. And I, I in, in, were you going to ask? No, about, yeah. Right. In, in my book, I do discuss that a little bit. Aristotle would consider them placements for slaves or, or servants. But I tend to agree with people like Patrick Lynn, who works on the ethics of driverless cars, and Joanna Bryson, who insists that we should make AI as our tools. These are tools, possessions that we are responsible for. Because if we don't, then who is responsible for the decisions of these things or the actions? Yeah. And so I'm, I, think, I think that's extremely important. And I would fall into that category. They should be our tools. Yeah, that's a position taken as well by another computer scientist who's thoughtful on this, Ben Schneiderman at the um, University of Maryland, I think, who argues for keeping... You, he argues against autonomy because of the issue of responsibility. Um, if the machine yes. is autonomous, no one will have his responsibility. Then who will be responsible? Especially, they're bo- they're going to be black boxes. They are already. I mean, we look at all the things we use that are black boxes yeah. to us. Back to away from mythology and to uh, the history of the period, the Antikythera mechanism was such a remarkable window for me into a world. How much more technology do you think we just don't know about because the metals were cannibalized or whatever right. happened in the right. interim? The only bronze artifacts that we have, statues, are that device. Almost 
maybe 90% of the bronze that we have from antiquity is recovered from shipwrecks or from the sea because it, all bronze was, can, as you say, cannibalized and melted down to make cannons and weapons, things like that. So there must have been other Antikythera-like devices. In fact, I think Cicero mentions something like that. And of course, that's from the Hellenistic period. That's um, not from the classical period. It's, it's from the period after the death of Alexander. So 4th century on. And in fact, a lot of actual automatons and self-moving devices were created. There was just a profusion of them in Alexandria at that time. And the, the first, not just in Alexandria, the first model of a flying bird, probably steam-driven. Uh, we know that it flew uh, a few yards and then had to be reactivated. It was created by a friend of Plato's who lived in uh, Italy. He was a statesman and engineer. All of his works have disappeared, but there are many quotations of his treatises, and we know that he made this uh, model bird and some other devices. And that's the 4th century B.C., in the time of Plato. So they did begin making uh, self-moving devices and automatons, some very complicated and some very simple. Uh, Ptolemy Philadelphus in Alexandria in about 279 B.C., he had a lot of engineers working for him in Alexandria, and he had this grand procession that lasted several days, went over several kilometers, these gigantic, what we would call floats, carts, pulled by like 300 men with gigantic automatons on them. One of them was the goddess Nysa. She's a seated figure. She's 10 feet tall when seated. Periodically along the route, she would stand up, pour a libation of milk into a bowl, and then sit down again. And very sophisticated, and as uh, engineers in uh, Amsterdam who have tried to figure out exactly how this would work, they've got a whole article on all of the mechanisms that would have to be at play in, inside the inner workings. And as they point out, it had to be very robust for her to do this periodically over and over again in a stately manner befitting a goddess. So that's just one example of the things they were making in those days. I have this, this image of these laboratories, um, or workshops, I guess. They, they were. They were in what was called the Museum of Alexandria. The, there was a, the Grand Library of Alexandria is very famous. But there was also a museum, and it wasn't just a, it wasn't a museum as we think of it today, but it was a, like a workshop. And there were lots of these guys, and there were rivals, and yeah. uh, showing off to each other. Ptolemy Philadelphus also had plans uh, with an engineer he wanted them to build a temple with a statue of his dead wife, Arsinoe, that would be su suspended in the air over the altar in this temple by means of magnetism. Wow. Well, that's impossible until electromagnetism. Yeah. But they were working on this, hoping that they could suspend a statue with a core of iron right. inside and a magnetic roof. So, that, I mean, they're... What a cool idea. <laughs> they're, they're working on dream yeah. technologies even then. Or well, you know, philo philosophers of science have, have actually stated that there couldn't... One reason I did this book is that they have stated there could not... No one could imagine artificial life before the... Or robots or self-moving devices before the technology existed. And it's just a, such an insane thing yeah. to say. You can't say that. How does yeah. innovation happen unless people imagine something that doesn't exist? Yeah, absolutely. It's just... Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thanks for your questions. They're really oh, yeah, fascinating. I open. I didn't even have to take out my note card. <laughs> <laughs>
We hope you enjoyed this conversation. Thanks for listening.